Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Event Marketing Redefined. I'm your host, Matt Kleinrock, CEO of Rockway Exhibits and Events. Thank you all so much for being here today. So a couple of weeks back, I recorded a podcast episode with our guest, Nick. We talked about AI. We talked about a lot of things. And like the second we got done with the episode, I was like, Nick, I said, we have to do a live show. We have to do a screen share. We have to do prompts. We have to show usage. We need to get as much of this information and bridge the gap on using AI tools to event marketers and how it applies to us all in events as fast as possible. So Nick is here. He's responsive quick. Nick is the director of marketing for Zenus, and uh, I'm looking forward to the show. Nick, thanks for coming back, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I do. Uh, just to show you how much content there is on this topic, I run a five-week course with AI. Uh, so I like I sit on a five-week version of this, ups, uh, et cetera. So we're going to try to do it in an hour and see if we can get you, you know, sort of elevated in one hour. So let's, let's see what we can do. Awesome. So just so everybody knows what we're going to do today is we are going to share screen. We are going to take questions. Once you guys start gaining an understanding of what we're doing in the prompts, the questions we're asking, I'm sure your brains, if you're on here have been turning of like, how do I use ChatGBT? How do I use Jasper? How do I use MidJourney? How do I use Adobe's product, right? What tools are out there? So I think one thing that I've kind of come to the conclusion on, which is from doing my own research for my own company, doing research for this podcast, the events industry, talking to Nick, looking at tools, messing with tools, having some of my team messing with tools. One thing I've learned, and I do believe this to be true at this point is, I really do firmly believe like AI is not just going to start taking everybody's job tomorrow, right? So I think what is going to happen though is AI is going to be a tool that you have to be able to use, that you're going to become more and more required to use. It will speed you up, make you more efficient. And frankly, companies are going to be looking at headcounts. And if they can have one person that can use AI, and do the work of two people. That is just the reality of what is going to happen. And from my opinion, you're gonna to wanna to be the person that is fluent in using the tools. So that's why I think this is important. We're gonna to try to apply this to as much of event, marketing, content, planning as we can today. And we're gonna get it kicked off. I'm gonna pass this over to Nick. He's got a screen share going right now and we're gonna rock and roll. Nick, go ahead, man. Let's start it up. Yeah. I mean, j just to give you an example, this is a lot of what I use ChatGPT for. I'm in meetings, you know, and you're in a meeting with five or six people and, you know, what are you going to do? I'm listening to the meetings and I'm trying to add stuff to the conversation while the meeting is going on. So someone will make a mention of something and I'll do research with ChatGPT and I'll say, oh, geez, the, the answer to this is already here. Or I'll start leveraging images to sh illustrate something that people are talking about in the moment, like actually enhancing the meeting in real time. Even you talking about, you know, the, the need for generative AI skills. I asked ChatGPT, you know, if I have 10 minutes a day, how can I get better at using ChatGPT? And it gave me these uh, steps on like how to do that. So, you know, using it to tell you how to use it is pretty interesting. That's not even an advantage. There's like infinite. I'll show you a few to use prompts better to get with it. And one of the really earth to give it a role, right? So here's the prompt I'm going to do. I'll put the prompt in chat too, just so everybody can see it. So uh, let's see everyone. Great. So this is the prompt I did as if you were a hosting's room person. Uh, what is it? Person. So meetings room, sales, what's a way an event, event marketer negotiate with you to get the best prices. So it's interesting, you know, we, we go into meetings and we go into meetings with blank pages and we go into meetings, you know, starting from scratch, but what we can use uh, generative AI to do is to get ourselves prepped and ready to go. So I know I'm going to have a meeting. I know this is the person I'm going to be talking to. I know ultimately my goal of this meeting as an event marketer is to see if I can get the price down. That's what I'm trying to negotiate. Well, what if I knew what these people would likely be able to do? So give it a role of the person that you're going to be talking to ahead of time and prep yourself. You know, this These are ways that they would be interested potentially in lowering their prices for you. I don't know if that works for like all suppliers, but if you ask a supplier, can you, you know, reduce the, this quote, they're going to say, well, no, et cetera. But if you know the certain like words to unlock for them, because it's their perspective, you actually can get that as an end goal. Like for me, I don't ask a, like a production company, Hey, can you reduce your prices? I say, what would it look like if we signed a three-year deal? And I know that from experience, 
But what if you, you know, put some empathy into it and say, what would these people, you know, when would they be able to do that? So getting the idea, all of this going into your meeting and prepping yourself is, is super valuable. I don't know. Do you have, is there anything else when you, when you interface with like someone that you, you're like, what are the types of meetings, Matt, that you go into all the time that um, you'd want to know from that person? That I would want to know from the person? Yeah. Or like, you'd be able to like prep, you know, like just to say, okay, what, what might do they oh, do? Like, prep. Say, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I go into meetings for like insurances for, for my business, right. 401k sure. discussions, you know, recently we were looking at, you know, new tax accountants, like what to walk in when I'm talking to tax accountants, like what's, you know, just some general things like that. So, I mean, for me, those are some things. And then Nick, is it, you and I spoke earlier and when we talked, right, I kind of gave you the idea of I had heard from listening to a podcast about AI that one of the best ways to think about it is to talk to it and use it like it's a really talented assistant that you have, right? Like, like an assistant or an intern that's working for you that essentially the more details, the more information you give it plus the direction that you give, the better you're going to get back out. Is that a good way of thinking about it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't know what you know. It doesn't have the context that you know, but it's eager to figure it out. And if you give them all the clues and all of the places to go, which means you need to be able to be specific in what you want in the same way that if you were to ask an intern, if you don't say things, it's kind of on you, right? So if you were to say, can you give me a report about some specific competitor and they come back with a 40 page you know, report, it's on you for not saying, I really just wanted an executive summary. Give me five bullet points. So you have mm. to think along the lines. Yeah. It just does literally what you say it would in the same way that an eager person who doesn't know any better. So thinking about controlling the output lengths is a good example uh, of would want to interface with them. It really just comes down to the fact that you have to know what you want from them. Uh, and there's a few different ways that you can organize your prompts to make sure that that you get the answers that you're looking for. Like one is the idea of goal oriented. So instead of just saying, can you give me this thing that I'm looking for? You would give me this thing because ultimately what I'm going to do with it is this. And it will configure what you ask for in a better way because you're actually telling it what your end goal with that information is. So for in that sales role play example, I was saying, you know, to get the budget down, you know, would say like, what would motivate them in order to reduce as I'm going into a meeting with someone, I want to be able to have that conversation. And I am a person who... So if you do all that, what you find is uh, it gives you the much better, better results in the same way that if you had an intern or if you had an assistant, you would say, ultimately, this is what I'm trying to do. That's one way of doing it. And the other way is the UX way of creating prompts, which is to say, you know, once I get this information, I'm using this information uh, in order to get them to, you know, change their mind or I'm getting them to, you know, want to be a partner with me, et cetera. And if you put the prompts in there with that sort of UX mindset in there, you get very different results too. Those are a couple gotcha. different ways that you can organize. Yeah. Nick, do you have any, maybe some good examples on ChatGBT if say, being specific, like you're an event marketer, you're working at a corporate company, right? You're running events, whether it's host events, whether it's, uh, you know, trade show booths or however, what, what would be a way that like an event marketer would utilize something like this to speed them up, make them more efficient. What's an example maybe we could show them? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I like to take survey data, which, you know, is great to have, but ultimately once you get to like line, like 12, you're like, I can't read this anymore. I, I don't know what this means. It's too much. It's overwhelming. Nice to have, but et cetera. Now look at this prompt. Can you organize these post-event survey uh, submissions into corresponding elements of an event? Right. So put this into something that matters. Like I can use, so you're taking all of the answers, Nick, from what I'm seeing, you're taking all of those 100 answers submissions out of your survey yep. and you're putting yep. them into chat GBT, you're, all the submissions from that survey. Yeah, it's going to read it and it's going to organize it in ways that I actually use it for. So it'll say, uh, give, give it to me in and organize just the top most important median information and put it into segments of the event itself. Oh, so I wow. want to know... Yeah. What, Look how what it's we breaking do with the out. Speaker? Keynote, breakout, panel, yeah. networking, workshops. It's actually drawing. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, and then you get to have conversations with it, right? So you can say like, and like the, the kind of stuff, uh, and I'll, I'll just stop like that. But uh, so like using this 
data. What they just organized the information for problem you. It took a hundred submissions is... and basically organized and summarized it. Yeah. Using this data, what are the three easiest problems to solve? I mean, what do you want to know from data, you know, from events? You want to know, yeah, how do I do better, you know, and where are the opportunities, right? So, okay, poor event app uh, experience. All right, get another event app, right? You know, solution. Here's how to mm -hmm. actually do it. So you can ask questions like, what are the easiest solutions? Or you could say, you could upload your post event survey. You can upload your budget and say, show me how to reconfigure my budget to organize it in ways that solves the, the problems associated with the budget. And it will actually yeah. take every one of your budget line items and it will draw a line of post event survey information that speaks exclusively to that. So you can have multiple pieces of content and ask them to bridge the gap between the two like that too. Agenda building is one of the most fun things that you can do too. I mean, like you can just have like a real simple agenda built out and then just keep adding stuff to it, adding stuff to it, you know, like, yeah. you know, me and agenda, what kind of what kind of agenda awards event from 6 PM to 10 PM that has networking and is for tech professionals. And you'll find out that it will give you the bare bones of that. And then you can iterate on this. It'll give you, you know, a bunch of different timings and stuff like that that are typical for events. And then you can start copy and pasting this. And then it's like one of the iteration is give me this in a table format. So this is done running. It'll organize this in, ta uh, in into a table. I can export this into with ChatGPT4. I could take it and, and put it into a deck. Mm. I can merge another document with it. But I go into a meeting. If one of the meetings that I had this week was I design uh, an agenda. If you start from scratch, you're wasting your time. You know, if you do this, and this isn't going to be perfect, but now you're starting from you know five, five steps ahead. And you know what you do with your time in that meeting? You have a better you have a better meeting that's more fruitful. You can just keep iterating with this too. So I like to do like, even, you know, if you keep this conversation going, you can, you know, go back to it and say, okay, now take the post event data and this agenda I just built and make sure that we don't violate anything that they said in the, you know, the post event data, like in this whole yeah. thread, we can continue to add documents that were in there before and just build on it, build on it, build on it. So right, Nick, yeah, right you, now, Wendy, uh, are you on I'm, the paid version? The paid version? Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, right. I am. Yeah. Mostly because I wanted to show you like what the fullest capabilities are. I mean, one of the main things that you get from the paid version is that you get, uh, and this is why it becomes like, you know, it, I would tell, tell everybody, you know, get the paid version and play around with it for a little bit and to see if you can get hooked on it. There's going to be something in this store that is going to be, you know, the most valuable tool that you would spend 20 bucks alone on. Like this is a good example of a, an app that allows you to create diagrams based on other data. So I could put all that post event survey data in there. I mean, I guess we could do it right now. And th this is kind of magical. So give me a diagram that is a chart from positive to negative based on this survey information. Copy a hundred pieces into this. And you will get a chart. Now, coming into a meeting, taking all of the post-event survey data and creating a chart that separates the positive and the negative, uh, and that's where you start, it, it becomes pretty amazing. Uh, so I'll have that cooking while we're doing some other things. And like, uh, you can also use the paid version to do Dolly, so, which is their image generator. So I, the prompt I'm doing right now is a photorealistic image of a trade show booth at a major trade show where someone is handing a business card to a professional wearing a lanyard, right? So it's going to cook that over here. It's going to start building me a diagram over here. I mean, these are the kind of things that I'm one person and I'm I'm not only the assistant you idea have this you all... have, but you know what? Now I have specialists. Yeah. yeah. Like it's I have a designer kind of over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have a designer over here. And I have a someone who does charts and diagrams over here, and I have a copyright over here, and I'm just in ChatGPT. You know, these yeah. are just different tabs running different things for me, and like this is this is what our day is going to be like. You know, like this is okay. My designer just got you know back this to me, 
you know, so now I have something I can use for my social media, right? I mean, like, this is great. Yeah. Like, this is ultimately, if I wanted to tell a story about, like, why do people do business with people? You know, like, yeah. we, wow. we, uh, trade show boosts matter because, uh, you know, it's where trust is accelerated. Now I got a social media post and an image to illustrate that. And that took me, you know, 30 seconds while I was, you know, also uh, putting together some of these diagram things take take a lot. It's analyzing 100 pieces of content and then it's sorting it into positive to negative and also creating the actual images for that, too. But I would say the paid version is great because there is hundreds and hundreds of like really like AI voice synthesizer. Do you wanted to turn that image into, uh, you know, what's going to be next, which is uh, this is the next level. This hasn't been released yet. This is Sora uh, for open AI. This will be uh, where the prompt is a stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street filled with warm, glowing neon animated city signage. She wears a black leather jacket, long dress, black boots, wow. uh, all, the, all that prompts right there. You're just describing. It generates it. this. You're, you're describing in it, and it's, yeah, it's, just describing. It's cre. It's creating. Yeah. It. Nick, I think the one thing, like just just as we're <laughs> we're running through all this, it's super cool. I mean, I think it's great that when you initially started, as we were doing this, you put a bunch of survey data into chat GBT, right? Which a lot of event marketers have. They're all getting surveys using survey monkeys using software, whatever it is they use to get their survey, Excel. So you're taking this data, you're putting it in. It then gave you a summary. So it took a hundred submissions, gave you a summary, broke out people's answers by whether it's networking, the food, right? It, it actually broke it out for you. You were then pretty much able to then ask it to then create an agenda potentially. What would an agenda yep. look like at a conference like this? Because you know, let's say you want to change it for next year. You're then also able to go back, take that data and put it into charts just by dropping it somewhere. I mean, you're doing the work of three, four people. Oh my, I mean, four, yeah. Like, I mean, you're just delegating. It's pretty wild. Right? It, puts you, it puts you in the seat and most event marketers, they're in the position to do. They're doers, right? And they have a lot of tactical work they have to do. And this is, the, this is why it's a big deal to give it a role. Like we said, think of it like an assistant, but really think about it like, the next level is not just a catch all or think of it as a data analyst. Think of it as a lawyer, you know, say as if, you know, read this contract. Is there anything in this contract would be an issue for intellectual, uh, you know, property? Like, you know, as if you were my lawyer, give it that, you know, opportunity. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, like I looked at that same survey data and, and asked it like, what, what would matter the most to a CEO, you know? So then you can create an executive summary uh, for a CEO, or you can design for those people. Like all of this is just, it makes that data come alive because if I look at it as, as a spreadsheet, well, yeah. I mean, who wants to read this? Are you kidding me? Like no, I'm not, I instantly go blind to this, but if I want to ask so you Nick, questions, if, you know, then I'm in. If an event marketer was doing an event at a hotel, right? So doing an event, they get the contract. They could basically drop that contract into chat GBT and basically ask questions like, is there anything here I should be concerned with? Is there any, right? Like it can, you can prompt questions yeah. to have it review the contract for you. Absolutely. You can ask it that you can ask, is there any additional clauses I should add? I'm particularly concerned about these things. You know, I'm in this industry. What is to all of those like plain language? Because also what it's doing ultimately is it's translating. And that's what the transformers in the in the T really stands for is it's doing translation. Legalese is a language. I don't speak it. I speak basic English. So I want to be able to my basic language uh, and turn it into legalese. And it can do that. I mean, I find that kind of stuff to be super interesting because it's making what was normally opaque for me uh, it in something that is actual and valuable. And it also teaches them as a way to explain some understanding of it can things. So think of it like, you know, you're at a table and normally you're sitting at the table by yourself. Imagine all these other roles that are sitting at the table that, uh, that now you know, you've got a lawyer that works for you. You've got an executive assistant that works for you. You've got a copywriter, a designer, oh. a deck builder, et cetera, all of these things. And, and that's why I get the, the paid version of it because it gives me more uh, team members, you know, because of the specials. Even like I use Kayak to like book my flights it will, and I can give it in plain English. I've got to be here at this day, this, this day. I, I, I don't like red eye flights. My, you know, I have to at least be there. I need to have time to do that. Like I can just absolutely just say all this stuff out loud. Nick, I got a question for you. Like using one of the image generators, right? So whether, you know, mid journey, the Adobe, I think you had Dolly on chat GBT. So say, yeah, I mean, a lot of times I know 
event marketers at, at trade shows, at their own events, they are constantly having to work laterally with marketing to get materials, to get images, to get things done for them to use. So say, I'm just trying to make it applicable. Say I, I was hosting an offsite dinner, right? Like we're hosting one and I had to have Cody. I had to go to Cody and say, Cody, can you make this graphic? It's an invitation. Can you put this together? So she has to go be creative and do that. But really now I could just go into Dolly and say, hey, I'm hosting an offsite dinner. I want it to be high end and yada, yada, right? And you're adding things in and say, you know, create an invitation. It's Nashville at the assembly food hall at 7 p.m., right? Like you're putting all the details in and then it could create something for you. Is that a way? Yeah. Uh, you can do research to, you know, what the, what the best restaurants are. Uh, you can create the deck for a presentation. It's to be, you know, five minutes or, or, or less because you only have so much time with that limitation. You can create the images that you're going to use to promote it on social media. You can have the email written all from the same content, right? You can, you can say, this is, this is a bullet point. I'm going to do this. I'm trying to do this with this many people, et cetera. Generate me an, an image to promote it, an email to send out, uh, a, a no before you go email to send out the day before, like just start delegating yeah. all the tasks. And this would normally be, you know, you in a notion and you assigning tasks to this person and that person and this, and, you know, and, and do we all have those people? And even if we do have all those people, do you need to, if you can simply just say, here's what it's going to be. Jesse wrote here, he said, the main reason that I question? have not used AI. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a question, but I think it's a good topic for us to touch on real quick. So Jesse wrote, main reason I have not used AI is that I haven't yet found a reason to use it that would help me with my work. The other reason is I worry that once I do find a reason to use it, how do I know the quality will be good enough? And then Melanie wrote in the chat to Jesse, that's what I worry about. I think that's a good- Yeah. Yeah. So Melanie says it feels fakish, right? So I feel like Melanie and Jesse, like it's a good opportunity to say like, at least my view on it. I understand the way you all feel like you'd rather just- craft and do it yourself. I think what you're doing is you're getting a head start. It's like AI is giving you a head start in a race. Totally. So if you have a project or something to do, you know, for example, I write a lot of content on LinkedIn and sometimes I get stuck. I mean, I just stuck. I can't get, I can't get it out. So I will use chat GBD to prompt something. And then whether I take a section of it or I take a whole piece of it and rewrite the whole thing, I think it's a starting point to get going. And it's a tool to then have you go in and make the adjustments, get it where it's needed and, and operate that way. That's how I view it. I don't use it. I don't view it as something that produces something for me. That's an end result. I don't know if that makes sense or helps. But that's just how I view it. You're in the same camp as me. Uh, I use it for a first draft. I use it to make sure that I don't have a blank piece of paper in front of me. I, I, I use it yeah. to turn me in from a, a writer into an ad, an editor, you know, because once I start yeah. editing, I bet I edit most of it away. You know, I bet it really survives, but it gets me thinking and it makes it much easier. Like, so I did this one while you were talking, generate a paragraph about how data in that market in a way that only Nick Borelli would say, it. here's his LinkedIn which wow. is interesting, you know, so it scraped me and it says, look, if you're in the event game, you're not leveraging data. Like it's your secret weapon. You're playing it wrong. Data isn't numbers and graphs. So it scraped some of the ways that I talk. Oh, that's really specific. <laughs> I mean, that's really specific. Yeah. Use reference, right? So, uh, you know, just say, say it like this, you know, say it like I would say it, but like, I'm going to give you an example of my writing and you could paste a bunch of links of your writing in there and paint it on you to sound like you. I still think you're right though, Matt, ultimately you should be editing it and you should be yeah, cutting and pasting, but this is, this yeah, isn't, I you know, game changing. It's not as flat as it, as most people expect AI to be. I just constantly view it as a tool and I don't use so, it a ton. So I don't want both. to talk like I use it a ton, but I, I know the hesitancy that I hear from Jesse. Like when people are hesitant, like I know, like I feel that same hesitancy. I'm like, I don't really want to get involved, but I think it's, it is a tool. It I, does speed things yeah. up. I mean, we are using it in our business. We use Fireflies, right? So Fireflies is an app that you put on like a Zoom call, right? Like your calls that you have. And it basically what it does is it summarizes the meeting. So no one has to take notes and then it puts together, it populates everything and then you can have someone look at it and rather than them having to sit and write notes the entire meeting and then having to them have to type it up and curate it out, they're basically being given 
a summary, the structure of the meeting, they can edit a couple things and send it out. So there are just so many ways of utilizing it to speed things up. And then as Cody has said, putting the human touch, putting the thought into it is really important. Yeah. You could take this conversation, you could put it through one of the platform, it'll turn this all into text. It, you can then start generating content from that text and you're not trying to recreate this. You're not listening to this whole thing, name everything out of it. Somebody mentioned the idea of utilizing chat GPT for persona work. I think that's a great example. So I did this one. These links represent examples of buyer personas. Our event registration company wants to sell to. Can you create a buyer persona from this information? And it, it took all those LinkedIn accounts and it made an amalgam of what those people have in common. And it starts to create everything from their values, their fears, their goals, from all the content that they've written. Useful, especially if you're onboarding someone and you say like, you know, what is it about these things? Let's take the five best buyers that you have and say, you know, we want to know who our ICP is. Why don't we put this into here and we can figure out a heck of a lot more about them because we're not going to just read them and have someone write a report. But if you had an assistant, you would do that and they have unlimited time. And, you know, you, you can say, go to these 10 people's LinkedIn accounts, figure out what they all have in common, how good they would be at that. I'm not sure. And how long that would take would also be kind of, you know, a, 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 a nightmare, but it could be done. You know, I have a meeting with this person tomorrow. This is my friend, Julius. I have an event production company. How would I get him to listen to what I'm selling? All right. So these are things that are super interesting too. You know, going into a sales call with someone, you can, you know, it gives you uh, some highlights as to how to potentially, you know, like demonstrate thought leadership. Julius values thought leadership and industry advancement. That's true. And it says highlight innovation and technology. And that's what Julius talks about. That's his, yeah. that's a big piece of his, what, what he delivers to an audience. Yep. So, so what's the right role on. for this one? You're the sales, you know, the sort of the gopher for the salesperson. You're this is the role is junior sales, helping a salesperson. So why aren't we doing this for every call? Why aren't we thinking about this oh. and prepping this? Yeah. It's pretty easy to do. It's a push button. You know, we have all yeah. people share all this data about themselves out there. You know, it's it's for you to just, you know, leverage. But if I ask you to do research on every single person's LinkedIn, you might say you'll gleam it, but you're not going to put this kind of executive summary together. And this gives you the playbook on how to engage with those people. Nick, I think we have on this call, I know we have some creatives, we have some designers, right? I know sure. with us here, I've talked to some of my designers, there are some tools where you can use it to design trade show boots. Like there are people using AI to design trade show boots. And I think, again, back to what Jesse and Melanie were saying is essentially, we're not designing a trade show booth, just letting AI do it and then producing that to client. I think when you're a creative person, whether, you know, however it may be, man, your brain only has so much power sometimes. You need, the creative brain, in my opinion, needs inspiration. It needs fuel. It needs you know, visuals, conversation, whatever gets it going. And I think tools like that for designers, why not use a tool to throw some information at it, get some visuals to get your brain going, right? It's like being in a think tank with a bunch of really smart people. You get in a think tank to get ideas, to get stuff thrown on the wall. These tools, whether visual, chat, GBT, Jasper, these are tools that you can get that inspiration. So if you're stuck on a project, you don't know what to do. Hey, yeah, see, I'm designing a booth for a bowling alley company. It's a 20 foot by 30 foot. They have a really modern feel. It's a new blah, blah, blah. You run into it and you see it produced. Now you may not take this and this may not fit what the client needs, right? But this may spark a creative person to be like, oh, I like that. I okay, do this let me in work meetings. Like yeah. that's the other cool part. Like in the meeting, as people are talking, right? You know, as they're throwing ideas in brainstorming meetings, like have this stuff open, you know, like just keep the conversation going and keep elevating conversations and getting people thinking. We were doing that at planning an IMAX with Encore. And they were talking about a friend of mine, Anthony Vade, had this idea of like these swings that people would be on at different levels and like lighting to create this atmosphere. And as he's doing that, I'm in mid journey and I'm taking the words he's using and I'm creating prompts. And I'm like, what you think something like this? And he's like, oh man, I never even thought of 
having this kind of lighting, this makes me think this. And then it just keeps it moving. It makes it move faster. Yeah. It gives you ideas. So not so much about like, let's use AI to cheat. Let's use AI to take a place of people, but let's use AI to bounce ideas off in order to inspire us to do better, to think, you know, to be more creative. It's not about necessarily just using it as a tool to replace us. It's a re it's, it should be a tool to inspire us. Yeah. Nick, we got a question from Wendy. Questions she's asked, yeah. Yeah. She's asking about platforms, which I think is a great question, Wendy. I do think there is a lot out there. There are different things. I think it does depend on the function of your work, right? So I do think what Nick was showing in chat GBT, when you do pay for it, it gives you tools inside of it that cover 20 bucks a lot a of month. this. But I yeah. get all this and stuff, then, right? So like there yeah. is a platform and a subscription for each one of these things or some equivalent of this, you know, all over the place. But like, the why ChatGPT is is you know basically owns their category is they've created what is ostensibly a an app store of free apps that just augment that you know and it's a just like Google Maker right? and S it's just like Google yeah exactly yeah and, so when you have you know, Google be, you have Gmail you have Drive you right like you it's the same thing but you do you know to Wendy's question as you go into these you can explore them and then start to decide which ones you may want to pay for or not. I don't know if that answers it for you, Wendy, but I would love some more specifics on maybe exactly what you would want to use it for, because there there are some very specific ones that I think you you know could potentially fit. Yeah, I mean, I would say the one I, I use the most in this is probably like the diagram maker and the there's one for creating like deck designs and like it, you can just do that in this. But like you know, if you wanted to specifically like what is new and exciting the fact that like you can have canva connected to it i'm not sure if this browser actually has my canva you know creates a linkedin image for someone using ai at a trade show hmm. could what you do a, a new linkedin image of me could you take sure. my profile uh and do a linkedin image of me that's ai I mean, I would do probably use this to take a picture of you and blend it with another image. Gotcha. Uh, okay. That gets it really good. Like one of the, so in blend is an opportunity for you to take one image and another image and put it together. But uh, yeah, I mean, you could do that. Sure. Would uh, I be better know, looking, Nick? That's the question. Would I be better looking? <laughs> My headshot is AI for that reason. Uh, <laughs> I had this like really cool hot pink sport jacket in it that was completely created by AI. And people are like, oh man, you should wear that jacket. It's really yeah. great. And I'm like, I, I wish it exists. Wow. Uh, Crap on. Wendy, to answer your question, I think when you do pay for the version of when you pay for ChatGBT, it gives you access to all these other tools. But Nick said you do have to pay for a subscription for those individual tools. Is that correct, Nick? On some. Uh, on, on some. And then, uh, but all of them, you get an incredible amount of horsepower for free in the sort of, you know, free version of it that's connected to ChatGPT. I would say the majority of them, there actually isn't a pay version of it because they're still in the early stages of all these things. Like they want to get you hooked on it first. You know, this is like kind of year one with this. And then after that, I think, you know, they'll have an enhanced version of it that will offer more things. But the amount of stuff that you can get, you know, for nothing is just more incredible than you could get from, you know, five tools, uh, essentially. Like if you get chat GPT and you pay the 20 bucks a month, you're going to get a hundred different things that you could have, you know, got and paid, you know, $10 a month for pretty quickly. So even the Dali, you know, in, as opposed to honestly, like if you were going to do anything, I would say do chat GPT and then use it for the Dali, which comes with it and doesn't, you know, doesn't have any additional prices as opposed to doing an image one. Only if you want to go really hardcore, if you do, if you see the difference between the output in in mid journey and you really want that quality you're going to get hooked that's why i pay for mid journey as well i mean this is this is not a person like this is mid journey absolutely... creates it so just so people know mid journey creates images from scratch so that yeah. that is one of the main things with mid journey is you pay like, nobody for that yeah you you tell it something you give prompts to mid journey and it gives you an image from scratch. It's not pulling an image off the internet. It's creating an image, which is crazy versus what Nick, like the Adobe version, you know, they have their uh, Adobe Firefly, right? Like you put thing, you can put an image in and then it'll help you upgrade the image or do things to it. Correct. That's the difference between those two. 
Yeah, the, I mean, there are there's generative features associated with Firefly as well. One of the limitations of Firefly, and, and also one that makes it, I think, probably the most ethical and future-proofed AI platform that's out there, is the fact that it's been exclusively trained on public domain images. Now, the challenge of that is the quality of what it generates is it's not it's like yeah. generations behind. But it depends on like where your organization is. If you wanted to say, you know, there's nothing that's going to come of this down the line that would be an issue. Like, but for right now, they're like th these are images. If you needed to go, there's no author of this that no one created this, and it scrapes it from the entirety of the internet. Same with you know Dolly as well. These are examples of that. Now, the iterative abilities to do this is why I like Midjourney. So, for instance, like let's say, okay, you, you need this picture of somebody giving somebody a business card, and you're like, oh man, what I really like is the second one. I could upscale the second one so I can get that to be in a bigger look. And then I can say, you know, do I want to vary part of it? You know, I just don't like his hair. I don't know why. I, I, his hair is fine, but let's say I didn't like his hair. I could give him another haircut and it will do a generation that it will just do that. Or I could zoom out by two, you know, two X and I could see their whole bodies. Yeah. I don't like to so, see we're doing hair digit AI haircutting right now, Jose. <laughs> and you know, it'll do. So by the way, I was also, while I was doing this, the haircut, I was generating another set of images of people at a trade show booth, giving a high five, you know, something that yeah. I wish I saw wow. more often. But, you know, you get the storytelling ability to, to be able to illustrate this. And if I want to back this up or iterate on this further or, you know, do four variations of just, you know, the third one, for instance, so I do a, a version of just number three. So if you're really into using images a lot, Dolly's, yeah. you know, it's pretty good. But like Mid Journey so much further ahead. Not only is the, the sophistication of how photorealistic this looks like this is not I mean, if you were to say this is a photo unless you really go hardcore, you're not going to know the difference. And, and every, I would say two months, the quality gets exponentially better. Yeah. Um, uh, so this Nick, is, we have they a, changed his, look, his hair's like this now. Isn't wow. They did change his hair. Good. Yeah, I don't know gracious. if I like this. <laughs> wow. That's, that's scary. We have a couple of questions here. Mel, hey Mel, looking forward to seeing you soon. My friend Mel asked, what are your thoughts about Google Gemini versus chat GBT? I mean, it's going to be the Coke and Pepsi of this world. Gemini has one thing going for it. I mean, it's not there yet completely in the language modeling, but it'll be there. If you're going to use something, this is what Bard, you know, previous version of this had over ChatGPT for quite some time is that it's training on live content. It, it, it is using newly indexed material from Google because it is Google. So when cert right now, if you're using generative and you want to be able to do it for research, I think no question Gemini is going to be better than ChatGPT because ChatGPT just has some lagging learning because it doesn't have access to its own search engine. It does one step removed from Bing. Uh, you know, and and they have a, a connection with them and it's sort of like API level, but baked into Gemini is Google. So anything that is about fresh information, if I were to say, you know, what are five things I need to know before I go to, you know, Maui, you know, it might, you know, it might be good to ask a Gemini something like that. But moving forward, once it can get, it gets caught up there and then the chat GPT gets caught up on, on that too. It's going to be interesting to see what the differences are. The version that we were shown in December of Gemini, which is slightly more mature than what they released, is its ability to see things. So you can say this trading card, you know, oh, I don't know if you see the glare. Like, what's the significance of this trading card? And it would say, oh, that's the 89 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. That was the first card in the first of that set, et cetera. You know, it's famous for this. I would say, you know, where, you know, tell me more about it. Where can I get that hat? It can see things is what I'm getting at. And you can see things in real time. So you can start drawing something and it can, you know, can say this and you can add a little bit more to it and show it then and say, okay, that based on this sketch, maybe if this is a 10 by 10 booth. I might do that. These are all the kind of things that like an additional sense that it has is going to make a big difference. So you're not going to have to interface with just typing or even talking. It's going to be able to just see things and interpret what's going on. Nick, we have another question uh, from Jesse. Uh, he says, I was told by a digital marketer that search engine AI recognizes content written by AI. 
So if we tried to use AI to write our website content or articles that search engines will downgrade those pages, do you know if this is true or not? I mean, I, I know that it's it's an aspiration of search engines to be able to do that. I think that's, you know, the last thing that they wanted is gaming things. When I started building websites in the 90s, there was no sort of breaks on that. So everyone was default black hat. I, I would I, I would say that's dubious. I, I would say that like your ability to filter it two ways around. Like for instance, if you have it generated and then you have it generated from another perspective, meaning, you know, shorten this or do it or or take it from this person's point of view, et cetera, then I don't know how it would be able to uh to two layers of content creation. I think that there's certain conventions that it uses and that's pretty much all it can do. There's no like back coding in AI derived content that is like, you know, putting something on there in sort of a meta way that would flag a, a Google or anything like that. I mean, like I, I could, I could postulate that, that Google might want to do that with its Gemini moving forward in order to do that. But like, I don't think that's that much of an issue. Uh, I, I will say that the, the content might end up being flagged because it's boring uh, and, you know, in, in the same way that like not necessarily flagged, but it just isn't extremely actionable because it's flat. So I would still say, you know, like you said, the real way to get around this and, and do it from a holistic standpoint is to use AI to generate the first draft. And then yeah. you modify it and you add your things to it. There's nothing at that point. It's not like it, it's not like magic behind all this this content generation that makes it so oh i know this is ai because it's written in that way it would more likely be the, the case that it is written in a super formula way and that a lot of other people would leverage that same formula and it would see that repetition as an issue in the same way that you know copy and pasting things and putting it into google or into websites would would flag it in that that capacity but the easy way around that is to a you know draft on top of it and edit it and two do it, you know, do it from another filter. So get a bunch of content and then iterate further on it saying, now, you know, make this more concise, use this kind of language, you know, et cetera. And then you're going to come up with something that nobody would use those prompts in the same way that you don't want to write something that anybody would write the same way. You also don't want to prompt in the same way that somebody would too. Yeah, it's a great question by Jesse. And Jesse, I, I take it from the question that you're a marketer. My thought just on that is essentially like marketing, like everything else, always changes. It's going to change. AI is going to change things, right? We're not going to know what's fake, what's real, what's AI, what's not. So I think what you're going to see is, is just my opinion on marketing. I think humans crave authenticity, right? They crave honest now, authenticity. That's a and, huge deal. And I think as a marketer, you have to be thinking, how do I deliver that to my customer? How can I if get gonna, an authentic message to them? Yeah. If I'm going to project what I think the next year, a couple of years are going to be with content writing, it's going to be this. There's going to be a high volume of boring content. And not only a high volume of boring content, yeah. but a high volume of content that that is less than human. So if I want to rise above that, there was a point mm -hmm. in my writing career where you know I was taught to take myself out of things, to make it so it's broad, et cetera, to not inject your things yourself into things. I think the opposite is true now. I think that you have to anchor everything you do to both the human condition and also yourself as a person in order to leverage authenticity and also to make a connection. Because I, you don't need yeah. to read my information. You can put it in a chat GPT, you can get the answer. I can get the answer. We can all get the answers. But how do you be memorable? How do you be sticky? How do you uh, stick in uh, and be someone yeah. that is trusted you do that by using some human emotion to it and i think that one of the easiest ways to do that is vulnerability you know actually saying to yourself you know i have problems with this too or this is a challenge that i face like letting people in is something that ai doesn't do it doesn't say geez you know you know when i was young i had this problem it doesn't have any kind of human condition as a filter for what it puts out into the world it just takes raw facts organizes it and and yeah. you know spits it out i love what wendy said here she's agreeing with you nick she said i agree nick i think events are going to leapfrog to being the best investment for marketing dollars AI is, ai is going to level the messaging playing field events are going to be the one way to get trusted connections i mean wendy I think it's always been the case. There's a reason that people gravitate to the face-to-face, -face, right? There's a reason we have this show and we have these discussions about meaningful connection and events being a sales and marketing strategy. I agree. I think the more that the internet 
AI to me is just a maturity of the internet, right? You're just seeing maturity, maturity, maturity. You're seeing technology and it is going to cause blurred lines. So I think part of the reason we're having a show like this is because I want to show people and I want to learn myself. How do you take that, the, the technology and make it applicable? How do you use it the right way? Because you're going to get marketers, you're going to get people, they're going to scam with AI, right? Just like people did with SEO, just like people built BS websites, keyword stuffed, bought domain. I mean, I can go on forever, backlinking, all this stuff, like people abuse this stuff. But at the end of the did day- you deal? Have you dealt I? with those? Have you dealt with those suppliers who had slick websites and everything on their and their social media looked really really good, and then you met them in person? Course. It's like you you don't know anything. Like of you've course, never done any of this stuff. It's and people now, trying to make a quick buck. It's people trying to yeah, leverage something. That's why that, we meet people, right? Like that's why that we look shit them in only the lasts eyes. so long. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. it only you lasts so eyes. long. It has a run rate. Yep. Yeah. And I, so I, I think that that's going to be exponentially increased where the ability to have, you know, to look, you know, to fake it, you know, and maybe you make it, but fake it is going to be incredible. Like the amount of digital falsehood is going to exponentially increase the amount of video content that make it look like oh, I did this or I could do this or whatever. Yeah. Th so th that's the bad side for the world. The good side for us is, is that we actually are the ones in charge of the only domain of truth, which is in person. So in person, like we know that this is real. Like when I'm telling you something, like I did a presentation recently where someone's like, how do you know if content is going to be good or not? Like, what are people going to crave in content? And I referred to it to a story that, you know, like that was personal. And I, I explained that it was like, I, I listened to a song from this artist and this art, I knew that, you know, it could have been an AI artist, but it wasn't. I knew this person explained that their album was about their mom dying. And I explained how, you know, I was listening to it as that was happening to me. And it anchored it in this like real moment that we all shared because I was vulnerable. I was authentic. And it was because another artist gave of something of themselves and did it from a human place. All of that stuff is going to really matter. But in, in the events world, that's what we do. Like most of the business we have are at around, you know, hotel lobby bars. Like they're about like, it's about the messy people stuff. And all of this stuff is going to help us do that stuff faster. And you're going to get more organized and all that good stuff. But our domain itself, like the live events are going to be an oasis from the, the sort of like me being able to create this image here that didn't happen. You know, like that, that didn't actually happen. And like, you know, this, this, you know, didn't, wasn't, and it's not a real a place. Yeah. It's not a that's real place. Not a real, that's not a real place versus like the other day I had a friend of mine I saw on Facebook, went to the Grand Canyon. Right. And like the picture I was sitting there staring. I was like, that's amazing. That's real. Like I was thinking to myself, like, that's, that's amazing. You know what I mean? And that, it, and it felt, that authenticity felt more to be there. Right. right? Yep. Like, yeah. and we can't even capture that in an image. So by the way, like you can take that, uh, I, I was cooking that uh, diagram. I forgot about it and it put it into a bunch of different formats. So I can take it to Miro, which if you use that product, it'll automatically kick it to that, which, you know, I'm, this is it, you know, whatever I can then start to organize this information and have conversations with that data. So it's twofold. We're going to be able to do what we do faster, better, et cetera. And all the, the world of events that are, you know, not necessarily as streamlined, as fast as all these other things in digital, they're going to survive for sure. They're not going to be replaced because people are going to crave these authentic, real experiences even more in a world that has deep fake videos and all this other stuff we didn't get, get into. And I really think that like, you know, events are going to, you know, benefit a lot from uh, a world of instant everything. I agree. I think I wish we had a little bit of uh, we're we're running up on time, but Wendy made a great point. I saw about events kind of overtaking digital in terms of marketing and the stuff you all are doing at Zenus with with the cameras and then essentially populating these reports. I think to Wendy's point, I think it's a great time to show some of this real quick. Nick, yeah, I can really quickly show you this. Yeah, yeah. Super simply, uh, what we do uh, at Zenus is we have like little camera kits and a box this 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 big. That's it, and we measure what uh, you know is happening from a uh, return on experience uh, point of view. So if you're at a a session. Uh, we have the cameras facing the entire audience and they're not recording anything. They're not taking pictures. They're not taking videos. They're just recognizing that that object is a face uh, and many, many faces simultaneously. And it's determining 
where, you know, the moments of the event where there's the highest amounts of energy. And we don't really measure things in events like that. We we measure things of how many people came in and we look at the post-event survey, which two to 5% at best fill out. We don't really know at the minute, you know, uh, 17, um, there was a real dip in energy. You know, why was that? Then you could see, oh, that's when they brought up, you know, some of you may be losing your jobs. Uh, but also, maybe there was a real dip in energy and it was just a bl- uh, people who were below f- under 40. Now, that's interesting. Why is that? And it was talking about something that you know you would want to know that th- these people reacted like that. So we can do look at sessions and we can determine based on AI modeling of, of faces, we can just not only the sentiment uh, of, of positive sentiment, but we can also determine their biological sex and their age range without interpersonal identifiable information, which so we can deploy this over the place and not have to worry about it. But like one of the things that's the most interesting is trade show booths, which you you attend a trade show booth and you you know you have a reaction to it. Most people don't realize that the only way that people uh, judge, especially and, and really in B two B, success of a booth or not is based on lead generation. That's it. That's our single metric. You know, if you capture a lead, not. But really, if you have a great experience with a brand at a booth and you you're not in a buying cycle, that's a positive thing that you'd want to capture and know about. Because two years down the road, you would find out that those people converted. But if you didn't measure it, you'd pull out of that show. We would not sponsor your event. Your event would lose money. Or if you're a, a booth uh, you know, manager, you, you would try a completely different thing next year. And maybe that would work. Maybe it wouldn't. But just throwing out all that data. So we can see based on – like I can do – let's see. I'll do it by – let's see. into uh, So if I'm an exhibitor – what I get instead of a funnel is right now I get, you know, leads captured, right? And this is just an example. I'd probably hopefully you get more than 10 leads, but like this is the only bit of data as far as every other booth gets is that how many leads they were captured. Well, we get you to say how many impressions that you had, who had a stop rate of 30 seconds or more, you know, actually looking at your booth. And then what were the what was the percentage of people who had, you know, a positive sentiment as a reaction to that? And then we can dive on this as far as uh, you know, comparing it to other boots you have, comparing it to benchmark information that we have uh, across all you know spectrums. Did your messaging do better with women? Did it do better with people over forty? These are the kind of things that we take for granted in digital marketing. This is yeah, the stuff totally. to what Wendy the CFO was saying. Is like, like this I don't is invest... we go to executives with. Yeah, there's more info. Yeah, we're believers. Everybody on everybody on, we know for a fact, trust is accelerated at live events. We know live events work. We know it. But do we get the resources that we need to do things at the level we want to do? We don't. And why is that? People with the purse strings go, it might work, but prove it and prove it in a way that isn't sort of it's a good show. It says something to be there, like soft, you know, statements of of sort of nothing. And that's why CFOs and CMOs get flipped two years is because they have to take mavericky decisions. This takes this out completely. If anybody's interested in the chat, there's information around me. You can reach out to me and I can explain like how this works. But what it really is, is it's taking digital mentality of uh, there's an impression that happens at each one of our, uh, you know, marketing endeavors and it, it tracks it down. So you can tell better stories like data is just storytelling. Uh, it, it It's listening to what people are saying and they're saying it with their feet. They're saying it with their faces and you can actually pay attention to what works and what doesn't, because if not... Uh, you, you end up, if, if for sure, organizers, your your sponsors are pulling out of your shows, not because the, the show doesn't eventually work. They're pulling out because they can't prove it to this. Exactly what you said. Nice. You know, again, I'm using all of this stuff every day to be able to show the value of live events. And I really think that like all of what we do, it, it, it doesn't get the recognition it and all of us uh, would be getting more resources, would be doing cooler events if we, you know, had more tools. And AI and generative AI provides us the tools, it provides us the assistance mm-hmm. we need to do more. And the data allows us to prove the impact of what we do in order to be, you know, to basically have better lives. So if you combine those two things, like I really think that AI for the first time ever is the silver bullet to uh, all of our problems, which is resources and time. Awesome. Nick, you were fantastic walking us, walking us simpletons through all this stuff. It was excellent. Everybody that showed up today, greatly appreciate it. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for the engagement. As always, we appreciate your time here at Event Marketing Redefined. We'll be back in two weeks. Hope to have some of you, all of you 
returning back, watching us, Nick, man. Awesome. We two episodes under the belt. This one was amazing. Great screen share, man. You did a great job. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate it. This stuff's fun for me too. I mean, it's just like exploring. We're explorers. I, I could tell you like it, man. You did a great job. Really appreciate it. Everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to find Nick, you find him on LinkedIn. Uh, if you want to find me, you guys can find me. You know where I'm at. You're here. So adios, everybody. Nick, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. Great job. Cheers. Cheers.